Okay, like that. I got it just popped up right here. Yeah, so we can see the both of us? Yeah. Just making your head look big as shit. <laughs> like a whole cone. Little dog. <laughs> Reincarnated. Are uh, you ready? It's going. What's on? Take that hood off if you want. If you want to go there, nigga. Uh, my head fucked up. My head ain't. It's the shingles <laughs> ain't fucked up. So you good? Uh, yeah, we locked in now. It, it got a good position on here. Pretty eyes, two seventeen. We see you. What's good, Tiffany? Alexis, ninety two star. We see y'all. DC first down. We see y'all. We doing an interview. Go ahead, let them know who we doing an interview with. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, the Landover Legend, aka Big T, and this is a live, live mm-hmm. interview of the I Can't Make This Up podcast. Uh, yeah, today we got a special guest, the host of the DMV Underground. Yeah, uh, a a recent car accident victim um, who's mm-hmm. coming to us uh, halfway crippled with the crossface chicken wing. Uh, <laughs> it's like that little hand don't supposed to go back there. <laughs> and uh, you know, even still, you know, just like black people, we fight through adversity. We make these things happen. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, he's a father. He's a rapper. He's an inspiring of people who's not as smart as him. Um, uh, mm-hmm. For everybody else, he's a jokester and a brother. Uh, give it up, uh, Cotto Lotto Henderson, everybody. Yeah. So what are we about to be talking about today? We 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 could talk about a lot of things, but we're gonna um we're gonna stick to uh, a little something something uh, uh a little something that we uh we touched on earlier. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh last week we had a conversation about the relationships on uh you know between baby mothers and baby fathers. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know what I'm saying? Before we get into that, I want you to introduce yourself to my audience and, you know, give them a little background on yourself. All right. Uh, my name Cardo. Ricardo. That's my government name, but I'm known by Cardo or DMV Underground. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm everything that, that uh, Turner said I was, but I'm a philanthropist, too. I just want to add that on top of that. But, uh, I've been doing DNV Underground Radio Show for about three years. It's a platform in the DNV that's one of a kind. Uh, we stream independent music on on air. Um, it's explicit content, and it's a two hours. It's just all crank, but it's it's all original music. It's the comedians. It's all the conglomerates of the DNV, and it's commercial free. And it's the only show one of a kind. So all you gotta really do is be from the DMV and have some talent to utilize the DMV Underground 943 platform. Before that, um, you know, I've been, I did a lot of work inside, um, you know, nonprofit work. I worked in middle schools. I, I did um, mentoring work for Alliance of Concern. Man, I, I just did like a lot of community outreach work, like work that's connected to, you know, looking out for my community or I can feel like I'm giving back in a way, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, I'm into so much, but I'm a magnify, you know, what I do. Like I do, I radio host. Yeah, and that's what, that's what I do right now. And yeah, DNV Underground. <laughs> I do a whole lot of things right there, but that's what y'all do. Yeah, DNV Underground. Okay, okay, okay. All right, yeah. so, um, uh, why don't you uh, give me a little insight um, to your experience as a baby father and uh, why you felt so passionate when we was talking last week? Because mm. I feel like, uh, well, like a lot of times, like the, the, the young men and how we core nowadays, like this, I would call it like a, a new era or evolution of dating, it's a thin line between that and co-parenting and everything. And uh, it's just what people are used to and accustomed to nowadays, you know what I'm saying? Me being a, you know, I ain't never want to be a baby father, you know, but 
I feel like it's in the air, so it's just inevitable that you'll become a statistic. So, you know, I felt passionate about it because I see a lot of young guys when I was in the court building and when they was doing these uh, custody arrangements and everything like that, they'll be busting out the courtroom, you know, real aggressive. And just they, they didn't know how to handle themselves in as far as keeping their composure. But one thing that stood out about it was that uh, that I could. And, you know, this this coming from somebody like I would see my men in child support court. I would see other young men in custody, but they just didn't know how to maintain that composure to have uh, to be impressionable to the judge. Because when the judge see I'm a good man, but when, you know, I ended up not having no custody. You know what I'm saying? It's not even somebody that had, uh, you know, violent uh, crimes or or whatever. I, I ended up not having no custody arrangement just because of a simple thing that uh, my baby mother just used against me. And like in the court, it was working. They just honed in on like my old past charges, like gun shit. Uh, we all shit that I already did probation for and all that, but it's like, being impressionable in front of the judge. And I feel like a lot of people fell victim to that. So, you know, and just me dealing with, uh, I used to work for Alliance of Concerned Men and Alliance of Concerned Men was a, a mentoring place in DC. And, you know, I was, you know, 25 years old mentoring people that was like, you know, 22, 23, and we real close proximity at age, but I would see what they was going through too. Cause one of my mentees was 22 years old with two children. And I just seen like the struggles he was going through. And it's like, I would see all the people going through these things, but even though my situation was fucked up, I still could maintain my composure. So that's why I'm so passionate about it because I feel like that's one thing just as a minority and black man that, you know, we need like, it, it all falls in mental stability and all types of things, but it's, it's just like what people consider is important and not, you know, so. That's why I feel strongly about that. I'm a baby father. I'm a baby father, but I'm transitioning into everything falling in place. Not because of the court, not because of my baby mom's mom, not because of my family. No intervention outside of just me and my baby mother. So I feel like I got the template just off of the coronavirus and everything that happened with Corona, and just like everything was just deemed to be unreliable around that time. All the things that we deem uh, that we that we are supposed to think is reliable and around that situation was not reliable. Like the, um, you know, the little joint places where we come and do the meetups for the children that was closed. The court was closed. They wasn't hearing emergency uh, meetings for like, you know, if you couldn't see your child. And, it's, and, and I look at it like this. If it was up to the government. And up to the baby mothers and everybody that got the power, I probably would have never seen my daughter through COVID-19. But like I said, I feel passionate about it because I figured out the template and I think I figured out a way to kind of like deal with these things. Cause I see my men go through it right now. Like, Carl, oh man, I'm about to go, I'm about to, I'm about to take this bitch for custody. Da 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 boom, boom, boom. I'd be like, no, think about it. Cause I already been there. You know what I'm saying? And I'm and I'm like, my daughter's five years old. Me and my baby mother, like the magical thing to this, like we actually was dealing with each other for five years. And I lie to you now, turns, I never talked to her for a good three. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but it's it's like real, it's true. And that's only because people so accustomed to like the norm, the typicalness. I had to deal with the family. I had to deal with the court. I dealt with so many motherfuckers. I ain't even had to deal with my baby mother. You know what I'm saying? So just to keep it a hundred, but I feel like that's why I feel so passionate about uh, co-parenting and, you know, being a, a father and everything just because I feel like I seen a bad portion about it and a lot of people go through like typical shit and like people make stuff the norm and it really shouldn't be the norm and that's why I advocate just for you know what I'm saying just being an outstanding uh, co-parenting and, and how to deal with a lot of these things that the black man and just the arrangement of what we place with but you know so yeah. before I ask you my next question, um, who told you how to uh, pronounce template? Template, Tem you know, <laughs> template. What I say, template? I said template. Template. 
<laughs> how y'all, how, how you say, we country. We Mason <laughs> Dixon over here, we say template. All right, so. Template. Let me ask you this. Um, before you found out you was gonna be a father, um, I'm, I'm assuming like most people in your situation, you never uh, considered all your prior charges to hindering future situations between yeah. the relationship between you and your... Uh... Good point you brought up too, yeah. That's a good point you brought up. Because I, I didn't I didn't take into consideration because I ain't know my baby mother was going to play that dirty within the court, you know what I'm saying? It's like you give somebody something and it's just like they, you know, they, they build off of that. But I, I didn't take into consideration. I wish I did because that's the thing. They they literally look at everything. They look at past charges and certain charges. You know what I'm saying? Anything domestic will hinder you. You know what I'm saying? And they got this thing. They got a... a it's just like a couple of rules that guidelines that will keep you in the the uh, vicinity of getting um, joint custody and you losing your custody. It's like, you know, you can't have family infantry, uh, infantry family offense. That's something to where you fighting amongst your family and it's a record di of a domestic dispute. Um, you know, you will have to uh, be able to have a job and things like that, but they take into consideration a lot of things that determine if you get the custody. But uh, they dig me out of every a lot be, just because I just had a charge with a gun. You know, I had a, a gun charge 2013. You know, my daughter was born 2015, but they use that shit uh, all the way up until they got the uh, damn. Um, the custody arrangement, which turned out for her to be permanent and me to be paying child support and me to do all these things. And at the end of the day, right now, we cool. We, I don't even need that. She do, you know, right now, I feel like she still got it to keep me at bay. You know what I'm saying? She she got keep me with the child support to keep me at bay and everything. But she really don't need it. She could call me and get a dollar and all that. And like, it's just. And the beauty of the COVID-19 and all that, I found, like, a silver lining in that. And, like, it all boils down at the end of the day. It's just, like, uh, that shit made us have to be parents. And then, you know, the children play a role in it, too, because they they going to advocate for the parent that they feel like, why well, I don't see them that much. So they going to, you know, they going to be they going to be more to deal with to their parents if they feel like something going on and they don't have a reasonable explanation because kids smart as shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that could have been a thing that helped too. Like when my daughter ain't saw me for a long time, she probably was like, where daddy? Kirkin. And it's just like, it was just on a different level because the COVID, because I couldn't see the baby for a whole, uh, it was at least a month and a half. So if I was going through it, I know she was going through it, getting on her mother's nerves and everything. And then, you know, interesting thing that I found out, like, it's so much people that go through um, uh, generational curses and everything. She, once she got from her folks, that's when we started getting closer because it's like we was cutting out the middleman. And that's one thing you got to understand when you're doing this co-parenting thing and when you don't want to become a statistic. Get everybody out y'all business. Everybody ain't gotta be in y'all business, cause like y'all, you gotta be a, you know, a parent. Parent, parenting helped me mature, in a way. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to parenting. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so um, everything uh, that prohibited, you know, like uh, <clears throat> courtroom appeals. Um, yeah. Any type of meetings like that, all that stuff was hindered due to COVID nineteen. So, yep, uh, it, was, it was plenty yeah. of people in, in your situation that went through that and couldn't see their kids because they had the uh, they got something called the the uh, youth visitation center, and it's an entity of the court. So, when I say they dick the parents around so much, and I feel like this this should be like a big thing, like. This should be something to be talked about because this is a thin line, but that kind of like got something to do with mental health. And just knowing like when that COVID shit hit, I knew the course wasn't shit. I knew the parenting portion, the, the family court was nothing. They didn't even let you file emergency motions. 
the only way you could file a mercy motion is if your child was in imminent danger. But how do how would you know if you know how would you know if you couldn't see your child? And then another thing, you would have to have a circumstantial change in in the uh in the visitation arrangement for the fall under for you to be qualified to get a, a motion. But they wasn't allowing people to do that. Although the COVID-19 was a circumstantial change. Like when I say they dig people around so much and I, and I just say, and I'm glad we talking about this because if my baby mother ain't come to her senses, when we ain't have all these middle things aligned to make sure that, you know, I actually got to see my daughter if she ain't really wising up, I wouldn't have got to see my daughter. I would be, I would be of somebody that I know that's existing right now that went through that. They didn't know how to handle it. Cause I would go to my baby mother house. A lot of times I never had a restraining order, but her folks ain't fuck with me. That was a thing too. Her folks ain't fuck with me. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, they just used to play with me, you know what I'm saying? But like I say, generational curses, they played with my baby mom's father to the point where I feel like I had to I had to dissect how she was for me to understand how to navigate. Cause my baby mother, she never saw her dad. By the time she was in college, her mom was just like how she was, kept her from her dad, continued with the generational curses. By the time she was 22, her father passed away and I was dating her. So I got the you know, experience her dad passing away and she got to experience my dad passing away. She got to be with me while my brother passed away, my older brother, and she still dig me. So when a female is fucking in a, I mean, excuse my language, when a female is in their feelings, it ain't shit that you can do about it, but roll with the tide or try to figure out how to navigate your way through. But I, find, I feel like I found a way and I feel like I'm blessed and I feel like if I could give like little pieces to help somebody out, I would, just like what I said, that real pertinent point is getting people out your business. When you got an arrangement that's so serious, like being a parent, get people out your business. Unless they gonna be there to help, if they gonna be there to gossip and, you know, she used everybody against me, bro. Like she even used uh, her granddad that we was cool with. Then I had to understand like, bro, I had to realize that sex they family and I'm like, he lied on me on, on, on the stand, said I drank liquor. You know what I'm saying? Just so it could weigh on her getting the the uh the custody. And it worked. All that shit worked, bro. They bro, all that shit worked. They even set me up at the um at the at the police station, right? This was around the time where I say you gotta be able to maintain your composure. They had a whole setup. They real live got a private investigator. Like this shit was crazy. I'm like, I'm real live going through this shit. They hired a private investigator to sit at the end of the parking lot when we was doing visitation so he can have a recollection of what they was about to create. So my baby mother made like a little fake argument in the parking lot. Me, her, and the granddad, they said they had a camera in front of the police station that wasn't even operational. Make a long story short, I end up getting locked up for no reason. They said that I threatened her in the parking lot. In D.C., you could get locked up just for making a threat. When I returned my daughter back to visitation at the police station, 5th District Police Station, they locked me up right there in, in front of my daughter. My daughter got to see that at two years old, see her dad getting locked up. And it's like, uh, I took a lot of anger out on that. Like, uh, Then after that, I got locked up again because I slapped her grandfather. You understand? Because they lied to me on a visitation. Was supposed to bring the baby to me. Then my baby mother, she was a, uh, she was, she was out on vacation because it was her birthday. Instead of just telling me, I can't bring the baby. They try to come up with a lie. But like these, just the things that I had to go through that I don't go through now because I feel like I found a template. Did you say you slapped her grandma, grandfather? Look, I slapped. Uh, Oh, I slapped her, yeah. But look, her grandfather and I know typical granddad, he's like a big guy. You understand? And uh the reason why I slapped him, and I feel like I was within good reasoning to do it because they they lied to me and told me that the baby couldn't make it to visitation. But they only lied because they didn't want to bring the baby and deal with me while my baby mother was out of town. So they had to come up with a way to the course to where they had to say, all right, we're not going to make this visitation. So they had to say the baby was sick. So then they had to go to the, doc the doctors. 
I found out which doctor place that they went to. They wouldn't let me see the baby when I pulled up up there because they was trying to make it seem like I didn't have the arrangement in court so I could see my baby in the center. But if later on found out that I had the paperwork that said that I was able to have the records. So I, I shouldn't have been kept away. But basically, make a long story short, they faked it. They was pushing the baby down Georgia Avenue in a stroller. She was eating chocolate, laughing and all that. I pulled the car smack over because my dad, like instincts, would not accept that when they was like, the baby sick, the baby this, the baby that. And, and she can't make it to the visitation. I said, first of all, they should have called with in advance. I'm not going to just take that. So I, I get out of the bed, turns. I ride up Georgia Avenue. I'm on the south side at, around that time. And I go to the hospital. I went to the children's hospital. They told me that the baby did come. They wouldn't let me get access to the records. It was just like, go and take me through all this shit. So I seen them walking on Georgia Avenue. They was pushing the baby. I pulled the car over. The baby damn near jumped out of the, the, the stroller. Daddy, he grabbed the bottom half of her. And I'm like, bro, like, I looked around first. And I put my hand real close to his face like this, right before I tapped that joint and smacked it. And I was like, bro, you're not going to grab my daughter like that. This is my daughter. And then I just thought about it. I'm like, really, like when people go through these co-parenting situations, the people that that intervene, they really feel like that, like that's their problem. Like that's their child. Like he grabbed my motherfucking child, bro. Like the bottom half, like we could have broke her if I didn't let go. You feel like if I didn't let go, the baby would have got hurt. But I just felt like, like this nigga real life. So make a long story short, I slapped this shit out of him. And I put a, I put this story out there right now because I know how deceitful and deceptive they is. I had to swindle the system. So when he came, the police came, they pressed me out. They still wouldn't get a baby to me. So to the officers, like, uh, I, I, I got something written up by that. But let me tell you the fucked up part about this story. I caught them in a lie. The baby mother was out of town, all that. And soon when we went back to court, bro, you know who they looked at funny? They looked at me. They didn't look at the fact that my baby mother took the baby out of town or nothing. They didn't look at the fact that, like, nothing. They just looked at the fact that I slapped that man. And we both got locked up because I said he hit me back. You know what I'm saying? Because that's some shit that they'll do. And by that time, I was already locked up, like, two times in. So, you know, and that, like, my daughter seen me get locked up twice. She seen her dad be out here being like that, you know what I'm saying? To the point where she be like, uh, "Daddy, I know, I know you not, uh, I know you not messed up. I know you not angry." Like, so she understand, she understand it, cause kids, bro, kids, they're smart. At two years old, I went to parenting class, and that's another thing I too, I gotta tell you too. Like, y'all being co-parents, keep the course out of your shit, cause the course guaranteed me custody if I was to do parenting classes and all that. I real life went out parenting classes, did the shit, my baby mother ain't do it, and they still ain't give me shit. And I feel like just, I feel like I was blessed to even go through parenting classes like that because it taught me a lot about children. You re you remember a lot of shit at two years old that you'll remember throughout your life. I remember going to my foster mother house at two years old. I remember the first day. I remember that, that she had a, a fucking pickles on top of her refrigerator and a jar. I remember what cereal she had. I remember the first time I got a whooping, but it was all around the time of two and three years old, and I still remember this shit. So I had to put my mind, you know, with my daughter to understand, like, she see this. So she might act in a certain type of way when she get with her mom. And it's just like, I say I, I, I'm blessed for COVID-19 because if, if that COVID-19 ain't coming, if it ain't extra course out of our business, bro, she would have never calibrated her mind to think like an adult, a reasonable adult. And like I said, after five years, she ain't, you know, she ain't talked to me for three. I never even had my baby mother phone number. A lot of people be thinking I'd be lying when I be saying that. It's like we real life never talked for like three or four years, bro, because she, you know, she went through something that that's not unfamiliar when the parents and the family just want to be too much engaged. You know what I'm saying? When and then I feel like a lot of things has something to do with her too, just not just not knowing, just not knowing how to trust a man. You know what I'm saying? Because she ain't never saw that shit before. You know, and, and they go back to generational curses. Like a lot of people with their family shit, you'll 
If you really think about it, a lot of things that happens over and over and over again. And I feel like, yeah, that's that's why I got the silver lining from that COVID-19 shit. And that's why I'm so passionate about co-parenting, because I feel like I found the way. And like and then and then it made me think too, because a lot of people ain't found the way. And then, and it's like now a lot of things people going through mental health, like it being stuck in the house, they not accustomed to their regular arrangement of living. Like this shit is a discussion worth talking about for real. So from from everything you told me, it sounds like you are more emotionally reactive than anything when it comes to any type of negative situation in your life. Because at this point, if you think about it, all the course here is that you, you know what I'm saying, you lashed out, you were violent while the mother was nowhere around and you was in yeah. front of your child. So obviously you're not presenting yourself as the person you're telling them that you are, even though you were put into those situations. So, you know, in my experience, you know, people need to, you know, temper, temper their emotions and, you know, get help to control those because if you trip out, you know what I'm saying? Who knows what that can jeopardize for you? It could it could be your life, let alone your relationship with your your daughter. And that and that's why and that's why I say just put it in perspective, that was then because you know, me relying on the court, they put me in a box to where I felt like I'ma just do whatever. Cause whatever the court doing, it and I felt like and it's funny you brought that up because I felt like that then. I said, whatever the court is doing, like I can't fuck with it. I gotta I got to do some other mean. Then I feel like they was playing with my my masculinity, like treat me like a beta male or something. I'm like, y'all really treat me like I won't slap the shit out of you. So let me remind you. But after I did all that, I was exonerated. I felt liberated, bro. Like I got locked up and he got locked up too. And the whole time we was in the cell, he was like in the other cell. And when motherfuckers was trying to talk to him, I, I found comfort in just seeing that man had to stay the night in that jump for real. And I know that sound fucked up, but I did. Even till now, like, I still don't regret <laughs> slapping the shit out of that man. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, I don't know if that's bad or good, but I've learned to forgive, but not forget. And, and like, for real, for real, like, he was in there the whole time. I was just bidding on him. I'm like, yeah, cuz he a cold snitch. I was like, yeah, don't even say nothing to him. Like, being on him the whole time, like we was in there. I'm talking about like I was. I don't know if you ever been locked up in Central Cell Block in DC. They put you in a little box that's hot as shit. They put you in a little box and you don't leave the junk. Their processing is different from Merlin's. And we was in there. He was in the next cell. I was just bidding the whole time. But like I was reactive, and that's why I say this stuff is so intricate that it could fucking it could touch your bone marrow if you don't know how to deal with it and a lot of black men in dc in maryland in virginia in the world are affected by you know this i guess this new era of uh co-parenting dating courting having children all that you know so it i don't know and i always felt like my baby mother wanted to be a baby mother like she wanted to i see her post and she'd be like is there anybody out here that's single parents that know how to do it? Da da da. I'm like, I just felt like she wanted to, she wanted to be the statistic, you know what I'm saying? And was okay. And a lot of women, they're okay with being the statistic because they got section eight, they got benefits, they got so much things out here that the woman can be relying on that it's like you they they feel like it's no need for that. I felt like my baby mother was like. We don't even need this nigga. We just gonna keep getting tanners. Uh they gonna keep taking my uh my child's my uh fucking uh my tax return. I ain't seen a tax return since 2013, to be honest with you. But I ain't never I never was the person to trip off government money because I always been an in the streets and making money type person. I always been real independent as far as like making money and I always knew how to use my head. So I never Depending on tax money, a lot of motherfuckers be out here depending on tax money, depending on stimulus checks, depending on this, depending on that. I don't even know if that shit going to come in because the first stimulus I got was taken away from child support. And it's just like, I, and then I looked at and then I even dissected that. I'm like, boom, let me look at all this, uh, the stipulations for how they taking your stimulus check. But it's supposed to be here to help a motherfucker. You understand? They was like, you can owe anything. 
It was like you can owe student loan debt. They was like you can own blase this. You can have any type of debt, but you can't have uh, child support debt. And then I looked at it like this even deeper. It's a lot of motherfuckers that's locked up, and they child support debt is just going up, going up. It's it's like one of those little things that's all set like a, a speeding camera. They get millions and millions of dollars for the speeding cameras and people speeding through the city, but we'll never know what they spending the fucking money on. You understand? So it's just like, bro, I just feel like, you know, I appreciate the opportunity because it's just something to talk about. And like I said, I did, I was irate at a point, but they, I feel like the government, the uh, the courts, they'll push you in that corner. By the time I slapped that man, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any custody. I didn't get uh, no, I didn't lose custody after I slapped the man. I ain't had no custody in the beginning. I never put my hand on my baby mother. We never had a domestic dispute. She never had nothing from me to even make make it make it seem like I was something that I wasn't. And then of course they eat that shit up. I feel sorry. I saw a young nigga bust the damn court joint open. He like, man, fuck you, fuck your gavel. I was like, man, you about to lose all oh, your. He said, fuck the gavel. He said, that's the little hammer that they tap on the thing. <laughs> so I was like, he just didn't know how to deal. You know, he ain't know how to deal with it. And it's, I don't blame him. That's some, it's some hard stuff to deal with when you're dealing with those type of situations. Yeah. See, that's, that's the type of stuff you see on TV, but TV ain't real life. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And on TV, you call cut. And they take them braces off you in real life. You you going down, and they, and depending yeah. on how much you fight, they gonna fuck you up when they get you alone. Ain't no cameras, yeah. no witnesses. You know what I'm saying? It look like you got on a, a halter top. I know it do look like I got on a halter <laughs> top. <laughs> but nah, that's what it is, though, bro. And I, I'm like I say, this is a good conversation to have because I feel like the black people, black women. Black men, they need to break the generational curse because that's one thing that I feel like just as black people that we are victim to. We we continue on generational curses. Like, you know, for an example, if you grew up turns and your mother was the black ball, the black sheep, her kids gonna be the black sheep. When the kids grow up, they gonna have the the end, they gonna have like that fine sweat, they gonna have that little that little thing where they gotta feel like they that they gotta do what they're accustomed to. Like my baby mother, bro, she never she never could chill with her dad like that and I really feel like when her dad passed away she was in college I feel like that shit hurt her so much that she did this shit to me okay and, let me let me yeah. ask you this real quick so you said that you uh you try to educate young men you know saying like yourself uh that's in a situation so yeah. one big problem that we have in our generation at least in the past 30 years in my experience is that you got younger and younger people getting involved with each other sexually and becoming parents at young ages, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So what steps do you take on educating them on not only waiting, but at the same time, not getting involved with somebody who you don't plan on, you know, marrying? Right. Yeah. Um, That's a good question. I would, and you know, that is a good question just for the simple fact that, like, um, uh, Everybody, it's a such thing as traditional dating. And it's such thing as, uh, I feel like what we deal with today's time is like a, a evolved version of courting, but it's toxic. You understand? So I feel like just educating people on like just, you know, the toxicity of how you court nowadays. Because a lot of people out here, they just fucking. Like they having casual sex, but not having like the titles, but they getting the legitimate feelings that come attached to being in a relationship, although they don't have, yeah. And they getting like, they getting the attachments, they feeling the same type of feelings, like if you're in a relationship, but you're not valued enough to have a title. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, like back in the day, I feel like a woman would have stopped you in your tracks and be like, all right, what are we doing? What are we about to be? Da 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 and this, but now they not doing that. But I would I would just I don't even know if I know if I would educate like me having a daughter coming up, I always thought that I wouldn't kind of like always be like, I don't want you doing this, I don't want you doing that. I feel like I would 
prepare her. I'd be like, you know, I hate to have this conversation right now, but if we got kids that's out here still in college at 13 and 15 years old, I realized, show my daughter, like, with, you know, pictures of, you know, get her prepared. Be like, this is, this is condoms. This is something that you use when you feel, like, I, I feel like just kind of, like, trying to change the dynamic of the conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, like, don't, like, not saying, like, don't go out here fucking, don't go out here, da 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 I want to be like, like, these are condoms that you use when you going out here fucking. And, you know, you don't get that to everybody. I feel like it's all about, you know, I'm not going to say that. Come on now. My daughter five years old. I'm going yeah, yeah. wising up a little bit. But I'm just saying, like, I'm not going to be one of them parents that's, like, so overprotective and trying to just say, don't do this, don't do that. Because them be the ones that be sneaking motherfuckers in the houses and be fucking and all that. Because I done jumped like off some that. balconies in my day. The ones like that, those are the kids that's going to OC and ham it. And when they do get that little bit of taste of freedom, they're yeah, the ones that they going to go, go, they gonna go crazy with the freedom. So... Oh, and that's a good point that you brought up. A lot of people go berserk with freedom. Like, I feel like molding a child, molding these, the youth, like a lot of people, they're rebellious. They like all things that re, that kind of like is a thin line between stuff. Like, I feel like with, with, if you don't got enough freedom, it's going to be a thin line between you being rebellious. And then with the rebellious nature, you're going to be private. You're going to be sneaky. You mean like, you know what I'm saying? Like that. So I just feel like just having just having deep discussion. Cause I feel like motherfuckers, when they get to talk about sex, they don't talk about nothing but as deep as busting the nut. They don't talk about the spiritual connection. They don't talk about they don't say yeah, passionate. Make love, passionate. They don't mention these things. They just mention fucking and everything. So I guess you just gotta realign. You gotta realign the definition of courting, of dating, of co-parenting, what is the norm, what is acceptable, just realign it, you know, I, you know, just realign it. I know it's, it's, it's cliche how I'm saying it, but that is a good ass question that you said, because it's not, I don't really have a, a straight up answer for it because everything that I've been learning, like, I would have to see the Messed up portion first to kind of like me recalibrate like how I want to go at it next time. So I just feel like it's it's a lot of ways that could be done, but you gotta have these discussions with the with the youth, just like these motherfuckers that's stealing cars and doing all that. Like the, the stealing car rate in DC is so high right now, and it's all young DC people, but they're being uh, they being fueled by like the music, sliding the free car like. All this shit that I hear with these young DMV artists music, it helped me understand the streets. It kind of helped me understand how dumb the motherfuckers is, too. Mm -hmm. I love y'all, yeah, the youth. I love y'all, but y'all dumb as shit. You need to get something on your head. Well, you can't you can't just call them dumb without giving them a Yeah, I give them I give them shit. I, yeah, I'm gonna call them motherfuckers now because I know out out here, I know outside this vicinity, and I can say this being real confident. I help a lot of people. That's Whitney, the lady that I got in the car accident with. I help a lot of people, bro. Okay. Like I help, all, right. but I help all types you, of people. You're saying that you're gonna call them dumb, but how do you know that the people they on there right now calling them dumb isn't the reason why they they acting that way? You know what I'm saying? Right. That's what I'm saying. Give them an alternate they, way of thinking. Well, because them like, people, they it can't be that. I feel like it's it's a lack of attention. Yeah, when they acting dumb. It's a lack of attention. It might be somebody calling them dumb, you know what I'm saying, and all that stuff like that. But you know what I'm saying? Like I gotta flat out be, uh, what's that word? Uh, transparency when I'm describing the youth. Like they dumb when they they go they break in the house. I've been locked up before 2013. All my cellmates had the dumbest charges. It was actually a, a shame to tell me. I was in the joint feeling like motherfucking El Chapo because I had real. Real charge. I had the gun charge. I had the high profile, you know, uh, drug junk, all that. These motherfuckers was in there for getting with they men, stealing little kids shoes and uh, people. It was a dude that went in the house. He didn't even steal the fucking jewelry. The jewelry junk was right under the sink. His man took that and then let him know this man took a phone. He took a, a fucking PlayStation. They left mounted TVs and everything. And I was like, bro, y'all dumb as shit. You know, but it's like I heard so much stories in the in the jail, 
you know, to the point to where I had to come up with that rationalization that people dumb. And then even I was in there and I had one of the worst charges and they put me on detail. So that was the, the CEOs even saying it like, damn, uh, you might be different amongst all these other motherfuckers. So we're going to give you detail, let you uh, pour everybody they juice, let you stay out a little bit more. You just got to sweep the floor and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? So in my experience in the, the past, I say 10 years, right? And all the women I come across and, and uh, conversations I had, one of the biggest problems I see when it comes to like dating and relationships, a lot of young guys, they don't know how to talk to women unless they trying to, you know, have sex. Mm -hmm. Like We just said that. It's like they don't. That's why a lot of young women play the game back because they know their generation. The now let her, are, let her finish. And you, she hit on a point too. Cause that, and, and it's, it's good she said that too. Cause turn, I want to tell you this. What she said, now the women are playing the game. So that changed the dynamic of this shit because it's like, I, I paid attention to this. It seemed like the females act like the men nowadays and the men act like the females because they they proud that they proud that that insecurity out of motherfuckers now and that and they say and I say that's because how we dating like the the norm of courting and dating that's the blame because of this because when a man feel like he own you when he really don't own you and then he giving you his all you know then you just got the the fuck up when he not getting that in return and then y'all both casual dating it's, it's just toxic so it is, it is toxic just casually dating is it never gets nowhere you yeah. don't end up together so, so it's yeah so don't you think that you know the whole 90 day rule thing or <laughs> you know getting to know actually getting to know somebody could prevent all that because if you can't sit and have a conversation with like a an actual conversation with a person yeah Mm. No devices and no interruptions like that. Shouldn't that be able to give you like a, 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 you know, help you weed out the people you decide to get involved with? Like, because in my experience, if I can't talk to you and you on your phone, then I, I don't plan on seeing you after this. You know, let yeah. alone uh, continue, you know, staying in contact with you, you know, and that should be on both parts because, yeah. you know, the uh, men and women do the blame game, but it's yeah. like, when you, no, you say, be honest with yourself, it's like you, you, you've been, let's say you was talking to a young lady or you was dealing with a young lady for three mm -hmm. months, you know what I'm saying? And you don't know her middle name or she don't know where you live, you know what I'm saying? And then she gets pregnant, you know, you can't yeah. say that it's, it's one person's fault and it's not, it was both of them, how they approached it. Now, if, you know, one person knew the situation and played it for what it was, then that falls on them. But, you know, at these days, people want to remain blameless and they want to mm -hmm. use social media. They don't, they don't want to take accountability. I feel like with them being, with them knowing each other in the three month time span with the example that you gave, it's like for her to get pregnant, if she's smart, then she wouldn't keep it because y'all haven't known each other that long. And then you don't know that man completely that you're sleeping with. You don't want to bring a child into this world and y'all aren't together. You don't want to mm -hmm. keep a generational curse let going me by let me being a single mother. Let me touch you on that. I mean? with, with the new generation, they do. Like these men, I feel like nowadays the Rolling Stone thing is more pertinent than anything. It's young dudes out here getting females pregnant and not calling them no more right after they get them pregnant. Like, this is, a, this is a normal thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a normal thing. But I do think, like what you said, that knowing people the 90-day rule, like, people used to shy away from stuff like that. Because I don't like putting time on everything, but maybe they need to bring that back into effect because people show you they best in the beginning. But 90-day rules don't always mean nothing. I know someone who went and did the 90 day rule, nigga got what he wanted, never hit her up again. Niggas will do you that way. Well, shit, sure. it's, it's, it's better it's, using a nigga for, for 87 days, giving him the pussy on the 90th day, than you waiting for the fourth day and getting a nigga the pussy, and then he act like, you know, he just act 
fucked up, but I just feel like in the in the beginning, people show you they best. So if it ain't no 90 day rule, it need to be something that that the person feel comfortable with to make them feel like, yeah, like uh this this is not this not a waste of a waste My of effort. Time. Yeah. Like if it's not a 90 day rule and or make them prove something, make them prove worthy. Yeah. Like a lot of these women, they not even making niggas prove that they worthy of the pussy. You know what I'm saying? Like they giving their pussy up to simp niggas and people paying for. It. Yeah. And you know, they giving their pussy up to people with money. They they being absorbed by money. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the easiest way out is the choices people make. I mean, it used to be quiet as kept back in the day, but then someone made it a wave. Someone made it a, a trend. You know what I'm saying? The forty dollar thing. You know what I'm saying? The forty dollar, forty dollars for the pussy. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, people hop on waves and and they keep them going like that shit cool. It's you know certain things because now back in the day we lived in land over where we know uh, they had prostitutes and shit like that. That's all know, like it's not just land. If, if you out there selling your pussy for forty dollars, that was the but that was the old race. Yo, females out here selling their pussy for two, five hundred, six hundred, but it's still some forty dollars hits out here. That's wild. That just <laughs> yeah, but I know what you're saying though, bro. Like yeah, a lot of these females started up started off with the forty dollar jump. And then they hopefully they progress to some good money by now. But some of them, majority of them are probably locked up. Pimp C said, uh, or... Two Chain said, I'll fuck your head up and give you the forty dollars to get it done. So I would I feel sorry for them females that uh you know. Right. Whatever. Let's yeah. So don't you don't you think that um you know uh a lot of the youth or Young people, period. They don't just have to be teenagers. They could be in their twenties or their thirties and still be considered, you know, young. Of don't course. you think that they're getting too much of their, you know, what I'm saying, uh, information or th the way they carry themselves from famous people's, you know? Gotcha. I'm, I'm glad you know you mentioned that too because I feel like even that the dynamics of how stuff used to be back in the day, I felt like. People wanted to learn from the older generation. People wanted to piggyback. People, if you were 16 back in the day, for you to be around a 24, 25, 26 year old, you felt like you was on, you was doing the shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They say, y'all can't hear me over there, y'all. They say they can't hear me on the other jump. What's your thing on me? Hold on right quick. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear? Can y'all hear? Oh, fuck. But uh, basically, so back in the day, you you kind of like, you value being around older people. You know what I'm saying? I feel like nowadays, even the rap game, I don't like how they try to change the rap game into like a, a young nigga wave. You know what I'm saying? Like the young nigga wave, like the rap game, I feel like they... That's a new thing too, as far as evolution. Like they people hopping on the young nigga wave, and it's just like I feel like we learning from the young people. Like the young people is they, you know, they they teaching people how to dress. They they telling people what's you know what's cool, what's hot, you know what's what's worth. I feel like business wise, business wise, yeah, a lot even like a lot of young moguls that's coming up. They you know they making apps, they doing things like this, and I feel like. A lot of things is just fueled by just like the young generation, but I feel like it should have a limit. It should be a limit to that because it's just like the code in the streets. It's like when coming up a neighborhood we was living around. I know that time around Columbia Park, Kenland, we wasn't learning from the people our age. We was learning from the older people down Hooterville. The, the, we knew older people, like, you know, even around Glen Arden, like all the people that we knew that was older than us but we was learning from them like we was learning from their mistakes nowadays i feel like it's not like that i feel like people want to be hip people want to uh just want to buy into this young nigga genre thing and, it, and it's real they making it so that hip-hop is 
the young genre too, where people could come in that joint, disrespect artists. Like I seen it like when artists keep pulling the age card, like when Drake was, uh, uh, you know, everybody, every artist be pulling the age card. Like you might see shows where it's the bad girls club and then it might be a female on there that's like 21. And then it might be a girl that's 27. And then she gonna try to like disrespect the girl by saying, like, damn, and you're acting like that and you're pushing 30, like shit like that. Like it, it's it's embedded in our culture that the youth don't respect the the elders that came after, you know what I'm saying? And me being in a neighborhood like ours, bro, I seen our neighborhood, like them older hustlers that was on the block in between and in the midst, like they was beefing with the young niggas, you know what I'm saying? But they didn't really have to. But this is this is a, a fact around our own neighborhood. Like the young hustlers was beefing with the older hustlers to the point of where like now we ain't got no strip. We ain't got no pull up spot because like they don't understand like that's not the real code in the streets. Like you can't have one generation that practice. We going we going to learn from our olders and our and our elders. We going to go to the go-go's with them. We going to learn their ways. We going to learn from their mistakes to the point of where like the youth just disre disregarded. If you 19 and you know to the youth you 26, you old and they don't want they don't want to hear nothing from you. Let alone you be 30, they going to think you're a fossil. But it ain't like that, you know what I'm saying? But this is how the world is. And I know bro like as you being an older person, you have to have your respect. Like me coming up in the streets, I knew once I passed that little marker, you know, 23, 24, I had to get my nuts tested in the streets. It'd be young motherfuckers. Like when I broke my hand right here, I broke my hand. I was just telling her about this story right here. I broke, I broke this hand right here. When I broke this hand, I broke this hand in Suitland. And real life story, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna say this story because you know everybody in the story, right? Boom. It was more trash. Right, so these this was a young guy situation. So uh somebody broke into my nephew's house. This is around Suitland. It's a real story. These are young motherfuckers, like not young people that don't know. They don't know how people is, but like another thing that young people do, they so willing to do the fucked up shit and take and take the whatever come after that. You know, I think back in the day we used to actually think about what's gonna happen to us, but nowadays. They're more willing to be like, all right, the shot's coming. Come on, let them come. I want all the smoke. I want all the smoke. No, that's not how shit go. No, no, it's not like that. So basically, we pull up. This man, he he broke into my nephew's house. He disrespected my nephew because he wore my nephew limited edition Jordans out the house. And still, like, walking around like he ain't do shit, right? So the word got around. These are all young motherfuckers. Man, you, my nephew, he's by himself. It's only him. There's like seven, eight, nine, ten motherfuckers around soon. I pull up and you know, like the, the whole, and I'm gonna tell you the whole feeling of it. Just like trying to do something I feel like that's noble to where people that don't respect shit. I pull up to the spot, all these motherfuckers standing outside around Sulin in the cut. It's three of us. It's Mortrez Dad, Morse, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna put all the names in it, cause this real life shit. And I ain't afraid to put this shit out there. It was Moors. It was more trays. It was three of us. We walked up to the niggas. Walked up to his house. They was all hanging in front of the junk. And we was like, hey, bro, like, we know you took the shoes and everything the case may be. More trays had his father right there, Terrence. You know how, explain Moors' bill, bro. Just explain Moors' bill. We ain't got to talk about that on live, bro. Okay. He's a, he's a big motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? He's just a big motherfucker, but yeah, I hope he even catch word of this shit one day, because I even feel like as a young nigga, how they probably could have lined me up that day, but wasn't no, you know, the young niggas just wasn't respecting that my nephew bought his dad, and he just wanted answers. You know what I'm saying? So they was trying to play with, they was trying to play with his dad. So I'm just chilling on the side. I got the joint in my pocket and everything. I got the joint right here in my pocket. Kept like a little 380 right here. I caught cuz, knock, knocked him out of the one hit jump though. But I broke my hand when I did it cause I was punching upwards. You don't never hit nobody with the back of your knuckles. You always hit them with the front jump. Broke this jump, whipped out the jump, whipped out the dog, ba 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 I ain't shooting the L nothing. And I tell everybody the story cause right after that, 
the nigga came to my sister's house and he threatened me. But after that, he ain't never walked past her house no more. But my whole point of bringing this situation up is just like how the young niggas did not show respect to that man's father. And although people, they do stuff, they'll people that you know that do dirt to you, they'll do dirt to you and still be around you. Motherfuckers will backstab motherfuckers and still try to be hanging around with them like people not going to be up on what you did. Like you, people out here disrespecting people. Uh, uh, What's that thing called Uh, when you know shit? I, I'm getting so he's Tele, just tele, well, no, tele, uh, no, uh, telepathic. No, nah, not telepathic. Not you telepathic. think about X Men? Uh, fuck. Uh, <laughs> damn. It's on the tip of my. Not even premonition. No. It's just like when you know shit. When people disrespect your your intellect or something like that. Smart motherfuckers don't like being disrespected by dumb motherfuckers. And it's just like if somebody lied to you about some dumb ass shit, you be like, damn, this motherfucker really insulted my intelligence. Real life, real life and sort of my intelligence, like thinking I'm that dumb. But my whole point of saying is like he didn't have no regard to what he did. He kept he just kept trying to talk his way out of it. Like, bro, we know you took the shoes. All your men out here snickling, giggling. I just basically was smelling in the air. And I'm like, these young motherfuckers playing with us. So I just stole the nigga and 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 let off the shots and did everything I was supposed to do. Like if somebody is to break into my people's house. That's how I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna I'm gonna get all deep into your your spirit, your soul. Like them them motherfuckers was so scared. He walked to my sister's house and told him like, yeah, we gonna get we gonna get uh so and so uncle. But after that, these motherfuckers ain't never walked past the house, bro. So all that did is just let me know these motherfuckers they scared, running around, want to talk to my sister and all that. But they just wanna they moving around. They 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 tra they traumatized. So they just moving around. They got to do shit to make them feel like a man again. Because you just got bitched in front of your house, in front of all your men. You wanted to get all that just because you wanted to steal a pair of shoes. You understand? So I use that example to say this: that's the young nigga generation. They don't care about the consequences. These motherfuckers, bro, like the, the kids that stole the, um, the car. 13, 15 years old. They stood in the car, Southwest DC. Like they stole the junk. The man died. You know, when the car hit, these motherfuckers, they asked him for their phone. Like the, and then when you look at the video, I think I looked at the video so much just because it's just so sad that the the black, the black people so ignorant. And you know, that situation has been a thing. Like that junk went worldwide, bro. Like, that joint went viral. Like people, them Muslim people gotta watch that video over and over again of the last days of their family member getting just on the ground and nobody helped them. Like nobody cared. Like the little girl got out and was like, where my uh where my phone at? So then like that, that's the young generation. And, and to be honest with you, I just like be uh I stay out the way because I know how I am. I hurt somebody. And these motherfuckers out here, they ain't scared to get hurt. And that's the that's that's the hot that's the scary part behind all this. I and I used to tell my grandmother, I used to know all the people on the news. Remember when you used to look at the news and you'll you'll know the people that's on the news because you'll be like, I I I know this person, I know that person. But all these new, I don't know none of the new people that's on the news. So I like it's just a whole new generation of craziness. And that's when I become scared. It's not craziness, like my personal opinion. I go everywhere comfortable. I walk around comfortable. I don't fear shit. And it's to me, it's not craziness. To me, it's just attention seeking. They feel they need to do something. They need to go rob someone or shoot someone or stab someone just to, to make it seem like, yeah, I'm big gangster. I'm tough. And but then the, and then, you know, the, someone that's really with the shit come and shut them down. It's all silence. The it's, it's nothing being said no more. They don't have nothing else on the news. They don't have no more cases. They just disappear, go off the map. You only hear about them that one or two times. The messed up part about the generation is they so fueled by the music. Like, <laughs> I yeah, remember once it's upon a time. Music, it's the culture. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they're being fueled by, a oh, good point that you say, they're being fueled by other cultures in the music. Because now D.C. taking over that drill shit. That was the big talk a couple of weeks ago because, like, you know, how Chicago music used to be. D.C. has adopted the look. They adopted the sound, smoking ops, 
rolling, da da da, no cap. It, like we adopted everything from another fucking culture within the music. And like I feel like uh put a lot of places on the map. Yep, Chirac put a lot of places on the map. That's well said. Well, I think that the problem that we have is that there's a lot of uh innovators. Yeah. yeah. That's uh being capitalized on as far as marketing and you know, driving up, you know, sales for the economy and everything. But yeah, there are a lot of there are not a lot of originators and uniqueness oh, is what, what made coming up like in the 90s so great you know the things that the people the young people certain young people don't respect is the things that made hip-hop what it is and made it so yeah. great so yeah you know without that you just don't have consistency that's why you always hear people talking about oh there's a there's another little there's another nba there's another baby or whatever you know what i'm saying because you know they're different, but they're not original. You know? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. U- uniqueness needs to be a new wave. And yeah. personally, that's why I don't listen to a lot of these new artists, and I don't really care to listen to EPs and mixtapes and when they drop their singles because, as a independent artist myself who model and do music and shit like that, I all my ideas are original. So when I see other music and I get glimpse of it from other people trying to share it or send it to me, I don't bother because it all looks the same. It all sounds the same. It's just the same message in different formats, mm-hmm. but I don't see, I'm not seeing a new message in different formats. And this is coming from somebody that's 21 years old. That's that I, I would feel like that's what's under the millennials. The generation next or X or some shit. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so and like I said, like he said, like I'm only 21. I'm young as shit, but because of my upbringing, being raised the way that I was, I'm very, I'm I have a lot of wisdom. You know what I'm saying? So when I experience and see how the music is now and then how everyone's coming up and trying to push their shit on the map, it just it all looks the, the same. same. Hmm. It's a jungle out there. <laughs> it's it's conversations like this um, that are publicized but not recognized um, yeah. on the front streets and on the papers of these uh, tabloids, and you know without that, um, nothing ever came. In my opinion, so I know that you uh you you look like you're dealing with a lot of pain. So we're gonna wrap uh we're gonna wrap this up. And um, we're gonna have to pick this up again one of these days. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm dealing with this pain, but come September, baby, when I go get that adjuster <laughs> and I come about this sling, I'm gonna be slinging motherfucking cash. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that thing made like Spider Man got, but I'm gonna just be making dollars come out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the strip club. All right, all right. So, uh, why don't you tell the people where they can reach you at and anything you got coming up? Man, y'all could reach me on Instagram or y'all could follow my YouTube at DNV Underground 943. Please subscribe or y'all could follow me on Instagram at DNV Underground 943. Y'all could send in y'all music. If you comedians, if you in the DNV, if you are entrepreneur, philanthropist, you doing any music comedy, videography, uh, anything. Reach out to DNV Underground because we want to let the whole DNV know what you're doing. And my platform is uh, Wildy Radio 94.3. Or y'all can reach us at TacomaRadio.org and that's worldwide right there. And we stay with that crank Monday night, so make sure y'all tune in. Oh, that's Shout out for having me on the show. Big T, turtle time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look like uh, Casey Jones after he didn't make it in the second movie and shit. Oh, damn. I look like the black Casey Jones he had to put on the joke. <laughs> Ready to hit a nigga with a hockey puck. It's like, let me stop. They don't think I'm racist. <laughs> Man, this this has been dope. Like I said, we got to do this again. It's just, it's just good, healthy conversation. I see like a lot, of, uh, a lot of your interviews and I just feel like this is just a good conversation to have, you know, especially, you know, with the culture and, and then, you know, 
Yeah, good ass combo. No bull. All right. Uh thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh this has been another uh installment of the I Can't Make This Up podcast. I can't yeah. with a K make this up podcast. You can find this everywhere podcasts are available. I'm also on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And when you click on this interview, man, don't forget to follow. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe. Yes, sir. And comments. And please check out my guests and all their platforms. Um, don't forget to uh, follow them as well and support because that makes all the difference, especially these days. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you guys for tuning in. And until next time, peace. Peace. Peace.